So this is chapter 9, The Family After Birth. The first few slides have the objectives. So the perparium is the postpartum period. It's uh, typically defined as the six weeks following childbirth. Sometimes it's referred to as the fourth trimester. The first topic we're going to look at is special nursing considerations for specific groups of patients. Um, number one, adolescents. Remember that adolescents are still growing into adults themselves. Um, their peer group is incredibly important to them. So um, helping them to assimilate back into their peer group, but um, at the same time care for their newborn appropriately um, is a challenge for um, uh, nursing. Single women are often going to be under financial constraints to return to work quickly um, so that's a consideration as well families at or below the poverty level will also have financial constraints that um, an extra um, uh, mouth will place on them sometimes these women will also have had sporadic um, or only intermittent uh, prenatal care Families that um, have had twins sometimes are faced with um, one or both of the twins needing to be in an intensive care situation if they were born preterm. It can also be um, difficult for parents to identify the individuality of um, each of the twins. Um, and so the uh, bonding period is incredibly important for this group. Cultural influences, we've spoken quite a bit about this in previous presentations, but the take-on point is that it's incredibly important for the nurse to understand that um, each patient is an individual, and it's important to adapt care to fit the individual's health beliefs, values, and practices. If the patient um, does not speak English, um, it's important to find an interpreter where, um, where you're able. A lot of facilities now do have interpreter services, whether it's um, uh, via the internet um, or whether it's on site. One important note is that it's important um, not to use a family member or a friend, if at all possible, um, because this can potentially either um, intentionally or not intentionally skew the message that gets conveyed to the provider and or the patient. It's also important to focus on um, acknowledging and um, accommodating dietary practices. Many cultures uh, focus on hot and cold foods after um, childbirth. And it's important to note that hot and cold in this sense does not refer to temperature. There are certain foods that fall into a hot category versus cold category. Um, particular examples of hot foods include chicken, eggs, and rice. There are a number of postpartum changes that occur in the mother. We'll focus on a few um, right now. Uh, the uterus um, goes through a process of involution. We spoke about this uh, in Thursday's presentation. Typically after childbirth, the uterus is at the uh, uh, point of the umbilicus, and it uh, begins to um, involute or return to pre-pregnancy size um, after childbirth typically receding about one centimeter each day. This, there is quite a rapid reduction in size, um, and the uterus will return to its pre-pregnancy size in about five or six weeks after delivery. And the failure of the uterus to do so is called sub-involution. The uterine lining, um, which is um, called the endometrium uh, in a non-pregnant state, is um, shed when the pl placenta detaches. Um, a base layer does remain in order to regenerate a new endometrium um, in order to prepare for future pregnancies should they occur. And the um, site of placental attachment is fully healed within six or seven weeks. As we mentioned um, 
in Thursday's presentation, the um, descent of the um, uterine um, fundus is crucial to um, controlling bleeding that occurs after pregnancy. Remember we spoke that if the um, fundus becomes boggy, that can place the woman at higher risk for hemorrhage. Um, the contraction of the muscles allows for the control of the bleeding at the placental insertion site. Um, Immediately after the placenta is expelled, um, the um, fundus, like I said, can be felt um, at about um, the umbilicus, and it is firm, um, and, um, and then it slowly begins to um, recede um, as the days progress. Lochia um, is vaginal discharge that occurs after delivery. Um, and it is primarily composed of endometrial tissue, blood, and lymph. Um, and it gradually changes over the course of the postpartum period. And I think I referred to that a little bit on Thursday's lecture. Um, the first type of lo lochia is lochia rubra. And um, this is mostly blood, and it lasts for about the first three days postpartum. Lochia serosa um, is more of a pinkish um, type discharge. And um, it persists from about the third day through the tenth day after birth. And then the third type of lochia is lochia alba, which is um, more um, clear and mucousy in um, color and texture. Um, and it lasts from the tenth day to about the twenty-first day. The cervix, um, excuse me, um, the um, lochia um, tends to have um, a um, odor similar to that of um, menstrual discharge. It is important to assess the odor of the lochia um, as um, you do want to keep a high degree of suspicion for infection. During the course of um, uh, these three weeks when um, uh, the lochia is being discharged, it is um, continues to be important to assess um, the um, uterus, the fundus for um, firmness. Um, many facilities, when the woman is in the hospital, will have the woman wear um, perineal pads um, so that the amount of lochia can be assessed on a regular basis while the woman is in the hospital. Um, if the mother has um, excessive amount of um, uh, discharge, um, then this should be reported. Um, the way that this can be assessed is that the pads can be weighed each time they are changed um, and typically one gram of weight equals one ml of uh, fluid discharge. Um, the flow can be heavier when the mother um, stands up and begins to ambulate um, just because of um, some lochia that is um, uh, state that is in a uh, state of stasis in the vaginal vault when the woman is supine. Um, the rate of discharge will also increase with exercise. Um, the lochia of, or excuse me, the absence of lochia um, is not a normal finding. A woman should um, typically have lochia that progresses through these three stages during the course of those three weeks or so. Um, and so that is also something that should be um, assessed and evaluated um, because it could be associated with retained blood clots. Um, or with possible infection. Remember that the fundus um, is assessed regularly during the course of nursing care in the postpartum period, and the assessment involves the following um, firmness, location, and position. Um, and um, particularly um, considering um, women who may be at higher risk for um, hemorrhage. And the um, uterus, the um, fundus of the uterus should be located midline. Um, if it is um, uh, uh, off to one side, it is important to think about possible bladder distension that could, could be shifting um, the uh, uterus off to the side. Um, if during an assessment you note a um, boggy uterus um, or fundus, that is something that should be um, addressed um, Typically, the measure that's taken is massaging of the fundus, as that can help stimulate contraction and therefore um, help prevent hemorrhage. 
Lochia can um, increase briefly during this period of massaging. Um, and it is important not to push down um, um, on the uterus um, because that can possibly cause inversion. Um, you just want to massage. Um, if the bladder is full, um, that um, can contribute to poor uterine tone. So that's also another reason to continually assess um, the uh, urine output in the patient. Um, it is important that um, as nurses we educate the woman about the progression of the lochia during the three weeks postpartum and it's also um, important to advise her about um, the following um, uh, red flags, so to speak. Um, foul smelling lochia with or without fever, lochia rubra that persists beyond the third day, um, unusually heavy flow, um, or lochia that returns to a bright red color after it is um, uh, moved on to one of the other stages. Um, medications can be given to stimulate uterine contractions. We talked about um, uh, oxytocin um, to, um, on Thursday, um, and that can be given after birth to stimulate uterine contraction. Also, um, methogen can, can, can be given orally or um, by IM injection. Um, the cervix... Um, regains its muscle tone, but it actually never returns to um, um, its uh, closed appearance as it was uh, prior to the pregnancy. Um, it, it has um, a slight bit more of an opening when you visualize the cervix of someone that has given birth before, um, you will see um, more of an opening at the cervical os than someone who is nulliparous. Um, the vagina um, undergoes um, uh, quite a bit of stretching during the delivery process. Um, that is one of the reasons that the vagina has the rugae. Um, it's really important as nurses to um, discuss with the patient um, uh, when it is appropriate to um, uh, begin uh, sexual relations again after um, uh, delivery um, typically um, has it, uh, patients and couples can be um, a little bit um, nervous about um, regaining um, uh, uh, sexual re relations um, and many can resume um, relations after the six week checkup. Um, the biggest point to stress um, is that um, once um, the bleeding has stopped and the episiotomy has healed, um, then it, it would be safe. So if that happens prior to the six-week checkup, um, then um, it, it, it would be okay. Um, however, it is important to remember that the vagina still lacks some of its lubricating ability um, prior to six weeks postpartum, um, so that could um, cause um, some discomfort um, during intercourse. Um, it is important to um, teach the woman to um, begin or continue with Kegel exercises. Um, to help strengthen um, the um, muscles um, in the perineum, particularly um, as those are um, involved with urination um, and with bowel function and vaginal sensations during intercourse. Breast changes um, involve engorgement um, as um, the um, a woman prepares to um, breastfeed. Even if she's not going to prepare to breastfeed, there will be initial engorgement. Um, the first couple of days um, postpartum, the breast will feel uh, full, but they will be soft. Um, by about the third day, they become firm, um, and um, blood flow increases, and um, uh, milk production begins um, in earnest. Um, breast engorgement can happen at this time um, because of uh, the, the full-on production of milk. Um, this can be very uncomfortable for the woman, um, 
if um, she is um, uh, nursing, um, then you know typically the infant will be um, at the breast and um, can help alleviate some of this um, uh, discomfort. Um, if um, women choose not to breastfeed, um, typically the breasts will return to their normal size in one to two weeks. Um, nursing care of the breasts um, includes um, assessing size, shape, and symmetry of the breasts. Um, important to assess the nipples, um, particularly for redness and cracking. Um, remember um, when I spoke about mastitis, um, cracks in the nipples um, um, and the areola can be um, a uh, method by which bacteria can enter to cause mastitis. can also be quite uncomfortable for the woman during breastfeeding. Um, it is important for the woman, whether she's nursing or not, to wear um, a well-supporting bra. Um, but you do want to make sure it's not one that impedes circulation. Um, if the woman chooses not to nurse, it is important that she avoids um, breast stimulation um, as that is going to um, uh, encourage uh, more production of breast milk. Um, the um, changes that occur in terms of the perineum, um, if there's um, an episiotomy, um, that um, uh, laceration and repair needs to be assessed regularly, um, and um, um, you want to be looking out for redness, um, erythema, um, uh, edema, um, discharge, um, ecchymosis and approximation. When we say approximation, what that means is do the two sides of the laceration meet together and are they healing well? Um, edema is swelling, ecchymosis is bruising, and D is discharge. Um, just want to make sure that there's no um, discharge, per particularly anything um, foul smelling or pur purulent. Um, treatment for the episiotomy, cold packs can be very helpful. Topical or systemic uh, medications can be used um, for analgesia. Um, and non-pharmacological pain relief methods um, can be implemented as well. Typically, um, cold packs would be used for about the first 24 hours, and then um, hot packs can be used as that will increase the blood flow to the area, which will help promote healing. Um, a couple of other um, things just to um, consider is to teach women to use um, either a peri bottle or a sitz bath, um, and these can really help with pain relief. Um, the peri bottle is um, just a bottle with a little spout on the end, and um, um, it can be used, um, it can be filled with um, uh, warm water, which can be quite soothing. It's also important to use that after bowel movements and after um, urination, um, just to ensure that the area stays clean. Um, the sitz bath um, it can be very soothing. Um, there's a picture of it on page 205 in your book, um, if people are not familiar with one. Um, return of ovulation and menstruation. Um, menstrual cycle typically will resume six to eight weeks if, um, after birth if the patient is not breastfeeding. Um, and uh, ovulation is delayed if breastfeeding. However, it's very important to remember that even if a woman is breastfeeding, she can still get pregnant. So um, it's really important to um, stress with your, um, your families um, that they need to have some plan put in place for contraception um, unless they uh, very quickly want to have another child. Um, cardiovascular system. Remember, as we talked about um, earlier, there's a significant increase in um, the woman's uh, blood volume during pregnancy. Um, usually it's about 50% increase. Um, and um, normally, um, the woman during a vaginal delivery will lose about 500 mLs of um, blood, and during a C-section, about 1,000 mLs. Um, but despite that blood loss, um, there is a temporary increase in cardiac output and in blood volume. Um, the added fluid um, um, does um, enable the blood to um, 
pump more blood with each contraction, um, and um, it can um, cause um, a lower heart rate um, than you might normally expect. Um, remember that um, the pre-pregnancy state is a hypercoagulable state, um, and so the woman can be at risk for developing uh, blood clots um, in the postpartum time as well. And we'll talk um, quite a bit more um, in Chapter 10 um, about um, the different types of blood clots to be aware of. Um, because um, um, of venous stasis issues um, and increased pressure in the lower extremities, the woman can also be at high risk for uh, developing varicose veins um, during pregnancy and afterwards. Um, blood values. Um, it is important just to remember that because of the the change in blood volume um, from pre-pregnancy to post-pregnancy, um, looking at values like hemoglobin and hematocrit can be a little bit deceptive, or excuse me, deceptive. There also also are fluid shifts that can occur, which can alter the hematocrit. Um, so um, typically, by about eight weeks postpartum. Um, the fluid shifts um, have um, uh, ceased and um, the values would be more accurate. Um, many women um, postpartum um, will experience chills um, and um, um, this is a um, normal physiological response and it is typically not associated with a fever. And um, orthostatic hypotension can result, um, and remember that orthostatic hypotension is um, hypotension that occurs when the woman changes positions going from a lying to a sitting position or from a sitting to a standing position. So it's important to warn the woman that she should, when she's moving from one position to another, do so with great care and take some time so that she doesn't get dizzy, lightheaded, or possibly faint. Remember that um, it's uh, critically important postpartum to monitor vital signs. Um, these are going to be done every four hours for the first 24 hours. And um, if the woman has um, um, a um, fever, um, that is going to be um, strictly uh, mo monitored very strictly um, um, for signs of infection. Um, remember um, to... to um, um, continue to assess for um, edema in the lower extremities primarily, but also in the hands. Um, and the woman's legs should be checked for um, signs and symptoms of uh, blood clot. And um, you'll hear in Chapter 10 um, the um, assessment techniques and um, the signs and symptoms of uh, blood clots. Um, remember, as we've talked about, that a full bladder can displace the uterus and um, can uh, be a contributing factor in postpartum hemorrhage. Um, so it's um, important to make sure that um, the woman is voiding regularly um, and, um, and that she is re voiding completely. Um, residual urine in the bladder, as many of you may know, can um, lead to um, growth of uh, microorganisms and lead to UTI. Um, the GI system, um, constipation um, tends to be a significant issue postpartum, um, and um, it's important to remember that um, there are certain medications that slow peristalsis, um, primarily in the case of a woman postpartum if she's nursing prenatal vitamins. Women were, will typically stay on their prenatal vitamins postpartum, particularly if they're nursing, um, and these have quite a bit of iron in them, which can be very constipating. Um, soreness and swelling to the perineum can also contribute to constipation. The woman also may be um, hesitant to have a bowel movement because of fear of tearing um, the episiotomy or causing more trauma. Um, and the woman is likely um, to be dehydrated postpartum, which contributes to constipation. So to help alleviate this problem, it's important to um, encourage the woman to take in copious fluids and fiber and increase um, activity, such as walking. 
um, skin. Um, remember that we spoke about um, some hyperpigmentation of the skin that occurred um, during pregnancy um, due to um, certain hormone level increases. Um, and this will um, typically fade as those um, hormone levels decrease. Um, the linea negra, um, which is um, the line um, that uh, moved um, uh, up from the suprapubic area, midline up to the umbilicus, um, typically disappears. And striae, which are the stretch marks, um, they um, fade from their color pre or during pregnancy, and they um, turn um, a silver color. Um, stretch marks don't tend to go away. There are some... Um, uh, over-the-counter um, uh, lotions that can be used, but I don't know that any of them effectively eliminate the stretch marks, unfortunately. Some women, too, find that they have what's called um, a diastasis recti, which is um, a bit of a separation in the abdominal muscles um, at midline that has occurred um, during uh, the um, labor and delivery process, and during the pregnancy, I should say. Um, and um, um, this is a longitudinal um, kind of uh, separation, um, and um, this um, uh, can also contribute to some of the um, issues um, with um, constipation. Um, this um, separation can ultimately um, be resolved uh, during the postpartum time as the woman um, does um, some strengthening exercises uh, to bring the, those muscles together. Um, such examples of strengthening exercises um, are um, uh, abdominal tightening um, and um, a head lift. There's pelvic tilt and the Kegel exercises. All of those can be important in um, strengthening the different muscles that were affected during the uh, pregnancy, the labor, and the delivery process. Um, the immune system, um, remember the importance of knowing the woman's blood type um, during pregnancy. Um, and the key point is, is that um, if the woman is Rh negative and the baby is Rh positive, um, then that's, um, that's an issue where you want to prevent um, blood incompatibilities. Um, so the mother would be given the rogam. And remember that the mother is given the rogam, not the infant, um, because we want to actually um, uh, stimulate the mother um, to um, uh, make the antibodies um, so that in future pregnancies there won't be issues. Um, also, um, the um, uh, rubella titers are um, always done uh, during pregnancy to determine if the mother is immune, um, and um, it is important if the mother is not immune that she does um, get immunized um, in order to protect um, future pregnancies. And remember that if the woman has been given the rubella immunization, she should not get pregnant uh, for a month afterwards. So now we'll talk about some changes um, after cesarean and adaptation of nursing care. So um, many of the um, same issues that we spoke about in the previous section hold true for women um, postpartum with uh, C-section. Um, there are um, a few kind of caveats. Um, one is that obviously the woman is going to have an abdominal dressing because she had the C-section. So it will be important to monitor the abdominal dressing um, for um, uh, any discharge, um, signs of infection. Um, Remember that um, because the woman did not have a vaginal delivery and because during the course of the C-section, much of um, um, the um, uh, placenta um, and um, the um, uh, contents of the uterus were removed, the lochia will be uh, less. Um, the woman will typically have a urinary catheter, um, which will be removed within 24 hours of delivery. Um, it's important to um, observe um, uh, that she is able to pass urine successfully after um, 
um, having the catheter removed. Um, and remember that anyone that's had a urinary catheter is going to be at risk for developing UTI. So you want to assess her for fever, burning or pain with urination, um, urgency with ur of urination. Um, respiratory care, um, remember to um, auscultate lung sounds um, and um, be listening for um, any adventitious lung sounds um, and um, in encourage the woman um, to be doing deep breathing and coughing exercises and turning regularly. Um, it's really important that she not develop atelectasis. And remember that because she is, is, is post-op, she may um, be less inclined to fully inflate her lungs because of incisional pain. So think about ways that you might help her to splint the abdomen so that she can um, fully um, uh, um, expand the lungs. So using a pillow or a folded blanket um, to uh, splint uh, the uh, abdomen. Um, any um, post-op patient is going to be at risk for uh, blood clots, um, so it's really important post-op to initiate um, uh, any uh, measures per your facility protocol to help avoid developing blood clots. Um, she should be encouraged to do simple leg exercises um, in bed um, and um, typically something like sequential compression devices or TEDS hose will be um, uh, ordered. Um, Pain control, um, it's important to um, continually assess the, the um, patient's pain level and um, also to reassess any interventions using the 0 to 10 scale. Um, and some women may have a PCA um, post-op to provide them with analges analgesia. Um, emotional care, like we've stressed several um, at several points during um, these presentations, it's important to care for the woman um, in terms of the entire person, not just the physical person, but also the emotional um, person. Um, this uh, mother and family unit has just undergone a significant life-changing experience, and it's important to make sure that um, emotionally um, she is uh, well cared for. Um, Ruben discusses um, psychological changes during the postpartum period and um, in terms of one, two, and three phases. Um, number one is taking in, so the mother tends to be passive and willing to let others do things for her. Um, number two is taking hold. The mother begins to initiate more action and becomes interested in more of caring for the infant. And uh, phase three is letting go. Um, mothers work through giving up their previous lifestyle and um, family arrangements in order to incorporate the new infant into the new family unit. Um, postpartum blues, we're going to talk about postpartum blues and postpartum depression in um, the next presentation. So I'm going to kind of leave that piece for that presentation. Fatigue um, probably goes without saying that um, because the infant is going to be up um, um, throughout the night, may or may not sleep well, and because many uh, women uh, return to work uh, very soon after giving birth, fatigue is um, a significant piece um, of the puzzle postpartum. Um, and um, it's important for nursing to have that discussion with the patient in terms of um, their level of fatigue and how they plan on um, uh, developing coping strategies um, in, in the home and in the workplace uh, to um, uh, manage um, that piece. Um, the father postpartum, um, there are four phases of adjustments having expectations and personal intentions, confronting the reality and overcoming frustrations that are inevitable, um, creating one's own personal father role and reaping the rewards of fatherhood. 
other family members, how they adapt is going to depend um, largely on where they are in their stage of their life. So for example, siblings, um, it's going to be very age dependent depending on how old the sibling um, is will uh, depend on how he or she responds. It is important if um, the uh, sibling is at um, an age that it is appropriate to do so to prepare the sibling for the new arrival um, and grandparents involvement um, varies from family to family. Um, grieving parents, there are um, uh, certainly um, parents who um, uh, sustain a, a fetal loss um, and um, um, the stages of the grief pro process um, I think that we talked about in our first class, the nurse-client relationship, um, shock, anger, guilt, sadness, and resolution. It's important for nursing to um, use the therapeutic communication that we talk so much about and also use um, the multidisciplinary team resources that are available to um, assist with grieving parents. Um, parenthood obviously can affect communication between partners. Um, the division of responsibility can be certainly a source of conflict both early on and um, as um, the family moves on um, past um, the newborn period. Um, fatigue is, can certainly create and um, increase irritability. Um, <clears throat> loss of freedom and um, decreased socializ socializing can cause a couple to feel loneliness. Um, when we talk about um, nursing in terms of OB care, it's really important to think about the family as the patient um, and so to develop a care plan for the entire family. So whenever we think about developing a family care plan, we um, look at um, all sorts of information, demographic information, family composition, occupation, culture, religious affiliation, developmental tasks, health concerns, communication patterns, decision-making, family values, socialization, coping patterns, housing, cognitive abilities, support system, and response to care. Um, so now um, let's look um, at phase two, nursing care of the newborn. Um, and we talked about a few of these things um, in the presentation on um, Thursday, so a little bit of this will be um, uh, repeat. But um, first and foremost, we want to um, support thermoregulation, remembering that um, the newborn can lose heat through evaporation, conduction, convection, and radiation. So what do we do? When the um, uh, um, baby is born, um, we're going to uh, towel, um, towel the baby off to dry him off. We're going to um, place um, a hat on the a head. Uh, we're going to wrap and swaddle the patient. Um, sometimes the, um, the baby will be placed um, under um, uh, heat lamps. Um, um, or some sort of heated um, uh, newborn crib. Um, so really focusing on thermoregulation and the reason for that is if the infant is having to work hard to maintain body temperature he or she is going to be churning up a lot of their glucose stores. They don't have a lot of glucose stores um, therefore that will put them at high risk for hypoglycemia. Um, also, if they are in respiratory distress, um, that um, can um, uh, contribute as, as well to, um, to issues. Um, remembering to observe for bowel and urinary function, it's important within the first 24 hours to ensure that both the GI tract and the urinary tract um, are patent. Um, important to appropriately identify the infant, usually with a wristband that's placed on the mom and the infant, and um, sometimes the uh, partner as well. Many facilities have very specific security measures that are now in place um, to um, prevent or hopefully prevent um, uh, kidnapping. Um, cord care um, 
uh, does occur um, as well in this early uh, period. Uh, we talked on Thursday about observing uh, for anomalies, uh, for example, looking at all digits, um, assessing for cleft lip and cleft palate. Um, vital signs will also be obtained uh, during this initial time. Um, the infant will be weighed and measured. Um, typically, um, the vital signs are taken um, at 15 to 30 intervals initially, um, then hourly, and then every four to eight hours. Um, that is typically going to be mandated by your protocol within your facility. Um, in terms of looking at specific vitals, um, respiratory um, rate and heart rate um, are as you can probably imagine, best assessed before disturbing the um, infant. Um, respirations are counted for a full minute. Um, they can be difficult to assess because they're shallow and can be irregular. Um, heart rate is assessed apically, um, and um, it is assessed for one minute. Um, the normal rate would be 110 to 160. Um, and um, um, in terms of assessing for temperature, some facilities um, will get rectal temperatures initially. However, some will not because they want to ensure that the um, uh, tract is um, patent. Um, so um, sometimes it will be um, an um, uh, axillary temperature that is evaluated. So it's just important to um, determine what your facility um, uses in terms of their protocol. Um, the infant is um, then evaluated for gestational age um, and this is done by looking at a variety of different um, parts of the um, infant. So the skin um, um, if um, the uh, infant is preterm or postterm, it is going to have specific characteristics. Um, Vernex is um, a um, kind of cheesy like substance that can be found in skin folds in a um, term infant. Um, and um, it um, is absent in a postterm infant, and it would be found covering most of the skin surface in a preterm infant. Um, hair, um, usually um, a fine lanugo covers the infant if he or she is, post, is preterm, and it's only found in a few places if the infant is term. Um, ears, um, preterm um, infant ears will spring back slowly. Um, and whereas um, the ears, when folded toward the lobe, will spring back quickly in a term um, or post-term infant. Um, in a um, term infant, um, there will be um, about a five millimeter um, uh, bit of breast tissue um, uh, uh, palpable. Um, and in um, terms of genitalia, um, for um, term infants, um, the um, scrotum will be um, covered with rugae or ridges. Um, and um, in terms of females, the labia majora um, and minora um, will um, show in a term infant um, that the labia majora cover the labia minora. Um, in terms of the sole creases in a term infant, um, there should be sole creases on um, the anterior two-thirds of the foot, um, and um, peeling would be um, evident in post-term um, infants. Um, the um, infant is typically assessed for blood glucose, um, and a blood glucose below 40 millimeters uh, grams per deciliter in the term infant indicates hypoglycemia. Um, another piece that I didn't mention in the last slide, but I just want to go back to, um, in terms of weighing and measuring, um, whenever we measure, we're measuring from um, head to um, the um, uh, uh, 
foot. Um, and we are also looking at head circumference. Um, so we're uh, measuring the head circumference at the um, area just um, above the eyebrows, which would be the widest por portion of the head. And also um, chest circumference typically gets measured um, around the nipple line. Um, so I'll go back to um, the hypoglycemia piece. So certain infants will be at greater risk for hypoglycemia, um, those that are pre- or post-term, those that have a diabetic mother, those that are large for gestational age or small for gestational age, those that have um, intrauterine growth retardation, those that have been asphyxiated, those that have cold stress, which is what we talked about in terms of the thermoregulation, and those um, whose mother had tocolytics, during the labor process. Um, typically, um, the infants will um, uh, continue to have um, um, blood sugar evaluations if their blood sugar was below the 40 level until their um, blood sugar is stable. Um, signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia in a newborn can include the following jitteriness, poor muscle tone, sweating, respiratory difficulty, low temperature, poor sucking, high pitch cry, lethargy, and seizure. Um, whenever we um, obtain a, um, uh, a glucose sample or a blood glucose sample in a newborn, it's done via a heel stick. Um, and um, that is assessing capillary blood, but it is done by a heel stick, not a finger stick. Um, <clears throat> so, um, to add a little bit more onto the heel stick, there are a variety of screening tests that are done um, before the um, newborn is discharged from the hospital. <clears throat> And um, they are assessing for um, a variety of um, disorders um, um, that um, can be treated um, but can also cause significant disability if they um, are not discovered. Um, so the uh, following include PKU, which is phenylketonuria, and this is actually a mandatory test in all states. Um, if the infant has this disorder, um, it can be, be given a special formula within the first two months of life that can reduce um, disability um, and prevent um, severe mental retardation, which can happen if it's not treated. Um, and um, other tests include testing for hypothyroidism, um, galactosemia, <clears throat> sickle cell disease, thalassemia, which is an inherited form of anemia, sickle cell, which is another um, inherited form of anemia, maple syrup urine disease, um, and homocysteinuria. Um, we'll do a couple more slides here and then we will um, take a break and um, I'll um, stop this presentation. So recognizing hunger in the newborn, um, hand-to-mouth movements, movement of the tongue, sucking motions, rooting movements and clenching fists, also kicking of the legs, um, and um, crying is often a late sign. Um, so I think before I get into um, the breastfeeding piece, I'm going to take a break and I will start up the next presentation with um, the breastfeeding portion. <clears throat> 